That was Susan. Thank you. <laughs> I just heard recording in progress. Yes, it is. Okay. 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 Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Marilyn Turkovich. I'm the executive director of the Charter for Compassion. And welcome to April's Golden uh, Global Read. And um, it's, it is actually Earth Day. So this is a very special opportunity for us to have this golden, uh, this global read. I'm so sorry, I keep going back to Golden Rule Day, which we had April 5th. And you would think that I know that um, that that has passed. But we offer the global read every single month. And this month, we're very pleased to have with us Marcel von Osten. And he has done the most incredible book called Mother. Um, it is one of those tabletop books, but it's more than that. It, and as the subtitle says, it's a tribute to Mother Earth, and it is a fantastic a tribute. Um, today, beside Marcel, uh, who is the primary photographer of, obviously not the primary, the sole photographer in this work, um, we have John Colkin, uh, who is going to be the facilitator. And John is also going to be with us in December for his own book, which he might mention. Uh, John and I have been working for the last few years on a compassion exhibit that is now in full swing. Um, and uh, he might even mention that because some of our various compassionate cities, uh, communities might be interested in bringing that exhibit uh, to your local area. John is a medical doctor, but also an incredible photographer in his own right. So I'm going to turn this over to John now uh, for the introduction of Marcel. And please, as always, if you have reflections, if you have questions, uh, enter them into the chat box, and then I'll make certain that, uh, that John and others see that. Thank you. John? Well, Marilyn, thanks very much. That's really uh, kind of you to um, get all this uh, started. And really, uh, I know I speak for, for Marcel also when we thank um, both you, uh, Lynn, and other members of the charter for um, uh, uh, putting all this together. Um, and you're right, it's a, a great, great pleasure to have Marcel uh, with us today. Um, he's uh, an extraordinary um, artist. I, I say that with, with great sincerity. And I happen to have actually a, a copy of his incredible book that we're gonna be uh, talking about today that uh, we'll get into uh, in more detail a little later, just um, so everyone knows, we're gonna probably take about the first 30 minutes just for a conversation uh, that Marcel and I will have. And uh, then we're gonna open it up to uh, queries and uh, and just kind of take it with, with that for the remainder of the hour. So with that in mind, first, uh, Marcel, welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't, don't know, he's uh, down there in South Africa right now and just got off of safari. Um, and I, for those of you, again, who don't know him very well, haven't had a chance to read a, a little bit about his uh, biography, he's, he's Dutch, he's a wildlife uh, photographer. He has an incredible, very supportive wife, Danielle. And he's been working on this particular project for at least 15 years now. He's won an incredible number of international awards, Wildlife Photographer of the Year, International Nature Photographer of the Year, Travel Photographer of the Year, and I'm sure that's just the tip of the iceberg. So without uh, further ado, uh, first of all, welcome, Marcel, uh, for being here. And I'd like to just start without even diving into the book at first. But if you can just share with us a little bit about what's inspired you to travel around the world for over 15 years now in very remote and challenging environments um, and photographing wildlife, um, you know, what's the essence? What, what's led to all that? Oh, well, thank you, John, for that introduction. And um, let me start by uh, thanking everyone for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, yeah, 
I've always loved nature from being a small child, always watched uh, nature documentaries with my, with my family, always loved being outside. And mm -hmm. um, once I started uh, traveling for the first time outside of Europe, that's when I realized uh, that there's an entire world out there that I didn't know uh, before. And then on my, on my honeymoon with my wife, Daniela, that's when I got into, first into contact with, uh, with like wild wildlife. Uh, on safari in, in Tanzania and that's really what uh, what kick-started it so that's when I just became obsessed with uh, with wildlife mm. well what about it even more about was there something about the the personality of the animals and were there certain animals that you were more attracted to than others can you tell us a little bit more about that yeah, at first I just loved everything. I just loved the entire experience of being outdoors. But then uh, uh, very quickly I started feeling that there's certain subjects or certain animals that I feel more attracted to. So um, in my case, as a photographer, it was uh, the, the bigger animals mm -hmm. for uh, very specific photographic reasons. But mm -hmm. especially the cats, big cats is a cliche, but it still uh, mm -hmm. really attracted me, elephants. Those kind of uh, those kind of uh, animals really uh, really spoke to me. So mm -hmm. I can I can it's a subject that I will never get tired of. So it just I just keep returning to uh, to photograph them. Hmm. You talk. It sounds like these are all mammals. Do you think see any connection there, or to you as a human, or tell us more about that? Um, yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting question because uh, you're right. I actually uh, like to photograph mammals much more than, for instance, birds or reptiles. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons easier to relate to mammals than to birds. Also in terms of expressions. So uh, when you look at animals, uh, a lot of them actually have different expressions. Uh, mm -hmm. Birds don't. Birds don't have only two expressions, beak open and beak closed. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> And like even a you know even a tiger or a bear can have all kinds of different expressions and obviously especially um, uh, primates and uh, and monkeys those are the ones that are obviously uh, closely related to us and that's something that doesn't go unnoticed when you're photographing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and and people haven't seen your photographs yet. Some haven't. Others may have. Um, they're extraordinary, um, but I think a picture um, is worth a thousand words in this case. So would you mind sharing with us um, some of these incredible images or anything else that you want to share? Uh, I know we can do a share screen here. So would you mind yeah. doing that? I don't mind at all. Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. Let's Great. see. Uh, there we go. All right. So just a very quick overview of um, of what I do. This is this is clearly me. Um, where I like to be best. So this is in the swamps in um, in uh, Louisiana, uh, photographing uh, trees. In this case. Uh, this is one of my most popular images ever. It's also one of my first publications in National Geographic. Um, um, I love this image uh, to death also because it's exactly what I try to achieve in my, uh, in my photography, which is uh, uh, impressive landscapes with, uh, with an animal in it. And I liked it so much that I made it the cover of my, uh, of my book. Why is it that you like um, images with both animals and the landscape in them? Is there a particular reason? Yeah, there is. So um, I actually like to photograph both. So I like to photograph wildlife and I also like to photograph landscapes. But I think that showing the animal in its natural habitat mm -hmm. is the most interesting to me. So I, I, I generally don't photograph a lot of super close-ups. I, I do. But when I can, I will always try to uh, include a lot of the landscape because it's the, it's the landscape that gives so much context to the, uh, to the animal. And uh, the landscape without the animal always feels a little bit 
empty to me. Mm -hmm. So just to have that, even if it's small, like here, it's actually tiny. It's not even like 5% of the image, but yet it, it brings that entire landscape uh, to life. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is also from my early days of so one of my uh, early uh, photographs that was also published in uh, National Geographic magazine in Madagascar. And here I do the same thing, but then with people. So here is a, a local uh, a local person on uh, on an ox cart in Madagascar. I, I over the years I made some images that went viral and uh, they will pop up everywhere. So if you Google lion uh, roaring or something <laughs> or attacking, this will most likely pop up. Um, here's another one that went uh, very viral. It went so viral that actually it's in the Instagram, uh, if you if you want to add a, like a, an icon in your story, then this is one of them that you can add. Um, so those are the images that really did a lot uh, for me, but I prefer images more like this. So um, very organized and uh, very graphic. And here's another one. This is probably as minimalist and as, as graphic that you, as you can go. So this is always what I'm aiming for. I have a history in graphic design, so I'm naturally drawn to these kinds of compositions. This is something similar, even though it's uh, totally in the wild in Zambia. Um, I'm not just trying to photograph an elephant because that's, uh, that's not very difficult, but I'm trying to photograph it in a unique way. So here that is, uh, it's all the habitat basically. So what's leading for me is the, is, is the trees, it's a landscape. Mm -hmm. And the elephant is, uh, is something that brings it to life. And if you add to both, both, both of them together, you get something that's more than the, the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. And here you see me doing something similar, but then in a landscape. So again, I'm using a very small element uh, to bring the landscape to life and to add uh, a scale to the image. Mm -hmm. Here's another example also with a, with a, with a person. This is a Tuareg um, that I photographed in Libya in the uh, in the southwestern corner of Libya in the in the Akakus desert. And you asked me earlier what 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 drives me to um, to travel and to uh, to go to all these different places. This is one of the things that I really like to do. It's to discover. So mm -hmm. to to go out there and even though most people on the planet think there's nothing left to discover on this planet, there's actually still a lot. It just takes more effort nowadays to, mm. to find those places. And this is one of those examples of a landscape that, um, well, basically hardly anyone has ever seen. And that's because it's extremely difficult uh, to get there. This is in Chad. Mm. My favorite cat is, uh, is a leopard. I just think they are uh, so beautiful and uh, so elegant and well-proportioned and everything about the leopard uh, makes perfect sense to me. And um, so those are at the top of my list to, to photograph, but also other cats, uh, tigers, absolutely love, also so beautiful. Here's another one with a, with a cub. Mm. It just it. instantly grabs you, I think. So mm. love that. Uh, like I said, also, uh, I like to photograph landscapes and then I like to also always try to, to make it look different than what's already out there. Mm -hmm. Like what I did here uh, early morning during fog uh, using heavy backlight to create those beams. And this is also a way to try to be creative with the camera by using a deliberately slow shutter speeds to add um, a painterly feel to, um, to the photograph. These are pelicans off the coast of Namibia. This is more recent work uh, with a, a remote controlled camera of a rhino. This is Im the images like this are dear to me because uh, it's actually quite rare nowadays to see rhinos with a full horn mm -hmm. and especially with a horn of this size. Mm -hmm. uh, most game reserves all over the world actually proactively um, dehorn 
the rhinos so that they become worthless to poachers. And it's a sad sight because we're, we're, we're getting used to seeing rhinos without a horn. Mm. So, uh, so this, is a, this is a dear image to me as well as the, the next one. It's very rare to see a rhino with a horn of that size uh, nowadays because that's, um, that's worth a whole lot of money. Uh, rhino horn is worth more than gold uh, uh, at the moment. So per, per pound or per ounce or whatever. Hmm. So there's the, this is a close up. Uh, this was photographed in Indonesia. It's a black crested macaque. And this is also something that I really like to do is uh, photographing species that are less known to people, especially if there's a story connected to them. And in this case, it's, uh, uh, it's an endangered species because of habitat loss and uh, because uh, the locals are eating them. And for the same reason, I wanted to photograph these uh, beautiful uh, monkeys. Uh, when I went to photograph them, um, hardly everyone, anyone had ever heard of them or seen photographs of them, yet they are also a, a very endangered species. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I try to do with my photography is to uh, bring awareness to a species like this, because uh, successful conservation starts with awareness. So if people don't know that something is threatened, then it's not very likely that uh, any action is gonna be taken to, uh, to prevent it from going ex extinct. Mm. Oops, uh, yeah, this is another example where I uh, use a lot of uh, habitat and the same species smaller in the frame just to sh give context to where this species live. Big mammal, I like this kind of contrast between cute and, uh, and horrific. And this is one of my most popular recent images mm. uh, that will also be used for the uh, Remembering Wildlife uh, book series to, uh, to get funding for, uh, for nature conservation. And that's it. So that's a bit what I do. Mm. I'll stop sharing. All right. Well, that's that's just that's just stunning. Um, you know, Marcel, I'm clapping for everyone else. <laughs> Bravo. Um, just just really stunning and, and just emotional. Uh, uh, you know, you can't, at least for me, I can't help but just connect with them. And when you talk about them in their environment and mammals, I think, at least for me, it's something I can I can connect with. I can connect the dots of, you know, our 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 interconnection, our dependence on each other. The list goes on and on. Um, so so thank you so much. Thank you so much for showing those. Um, and that kind of leads me into this question about the book itself. You know, like you, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but can you tell us a little bit more about what are some of the key messages that you're trying to convey um, through the book? What inspired you to do this particular book? Yeah, so there's basically two reasons for me to, uh, the, 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 to make this book. Uh, one of them is I, I thought it was time to create uh, like an overview of the, the work that I've done over the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. And nothing is better uh, than a book, I think, for that. But I didn't just want it to be a pretty book with pretty images. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's that. So I really wanted to use my, uh, my presence in, in the online and in the media to, um, to also uh, teach people about what they're looking at and um, explain what's going on with our planet. Uh, we all know that uh, our planet is facing a lot of threats from all different angles and uh, climate change being one of them. But uh, there's a lot more uh, going on, and especially with wildlife. There are so many threats and there are so many species that go extinct uh, even daily. Um, and also a lot of larger species that we all know that are um, heavily under, under threat. Mm -hmm. And most people are not aware. And so I'm using the images in my book to explain what those threats are, where mm -hmm. they're coming from. And um, hopefully this will, um, um, how do you call it? Um, make people uh, more active mm -hmm. 
uh, with, reg with regards to uh, wildlife conservation. Yeah, and I know one of the things that you and I had a conversation about this before, and I know you talked about it a little bit in the book, is the concept of where is the threat coming from? And is it necessarily coming from the places or the things that, that we normally think about? Would you mind going into that a little bit more? Yeah, so if you, if you look at all the, uh, all the animals that are threatened uh, or endangered, um, <clears throat> the, th the threats uh, that they're facing have a lot of similarities. Um, they're of they often have to do with uh, climate change. However, that's just one of many. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most common threats is actually habitat loss. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's either because of uh, deforestation, for instance, uh, for, uh, for agriculture, mm -hmm. or it's just for um, uh, building buildings and houses and cities, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's one of the biggest habitat, uh, habitat loss or habitat fragmentation. And um, the other one that's big is, um, is poaching and hunting and also eating of certain species. So as, as, as strange as the concept of eating monkeys may be to us, there's a lot of places in the world where eating a monkey is, um, is actually very normal, um, mm -hmm. which may not be a problem, but it becomes a problem when that species um, is close, getting close to extinction because of that. Yeah, it's interesting uh, timing wise. I just got an email um, this morning from someone who saw some of my work at an exhibition, and um, it's the photograph, the, it's a um, drawing of half um, pig, half dog. And it says, why do we eat one and love the other? And the person was asking me about that. And I was saying, well, in, when I've been to doing medical work in Vietnam, um, back in the 90s, it's normal, it's natural to eat dogs. It's kind of like, what do we get used to? And what do we think is acceptable? And what's, what's not? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, it's, uh, in many ways, it's irrational to, uh, to eat the one and, and not the other. And that's, it's very much a cultural thing. I've been to markets in Indonesia where there's uh, cages full of little puppies, uh, not for not for pets, but uh, for food. You know? Right. Yeah, we have about seven more minutes before we're going to open it up for questions, and then we may have some time, depending on how many questions there are, for me to to pepper you with a, a few more. But um, one of the things I wanted to make sure that we we covered was this concept of okay there are all kinds of things going on around the world, all that sorts of things we could potentially get involved in we, that we can also get upset about. Um, but sometimes if we get too dispersed, it can cause to, you know, um, uh, empathic distress and burnout. So uh, do you have some advice, you know, you've managed to stay focused um, on, on what you're doing uh, extraordinarily well. Um, I mean, the results of your work show, show that. Um, so do you have any advice for people about how to stay focused on something that they think is important? Um, and specifically also when it has to do with wildlife, are there specific things? Yeah, there's so, I think there's so many things that you, uh, that you can do uh, to help and it doesn't need to be uh, like big, it can be small things. Uh, I would say that probably the most important thing uh, is that you, uh, like your political choice obviously is very important because uh, it's usually uh, the, the, the government of your, of, your, of your country that decides where, how much money they're gonna spend on either fighting climate change or uh, how much money they're gonna spend on uh, wildlife or nature conservation. So I think that's probably the most important, uh, important one. And then other than that, there's, there's so many organizations in the world that are trying to uh, do the right thing, that are trying to uh, save these, these species from going extinct. So you can also like pick a few and donate even a small amount uh, because uh, a lot of those small amounts together will mean that um, that, that organization might um, um, might accomplish more uh, than they can do now. And also sharing, uh, sharing news 
about nature conservation or about an animal that is endangered will also help because like I mentioned earlier, successful conservation starts with awareness. So uh, awareness is really important and that's what you can use for instance, social media for to just make people aware that for instance, lions are uh, getting uh, threatened in their existence and cheetahs and giraffe and people just don't know. They think it's only tigers and that it's only uh, polar bears, but there's a lot of species that are, are struggling. And it's important that people know. And just by telling them or sharing that kind of information with others, you can already uh, well, open doors in, in, the, in the good direction. Yeah, one of the things that um, it, it was struck me about your photographs, and you and I spoke about this a little bit earlier, was that you really tend to focus on the beauty um, one of the things I've, I've heard from, from some of these different foundations that are trying to um, protect animals is that they found that when they showed images which were graphically horrific, even though that's part of the reality, the amount of um, donations was not very high. But when they could show the beauty of animals in nature and the humanity, if you want to call it, of animals, and their emotions and whatnot that that their the amount of donations went up. So from a from a uh, science perspective and a psychological perspective, um, motivating people through your work um, is just really you know a, a great gift uh, that that you've uh, you know shared with us. So I really appreciate that. We have about three more minutes before we're gonna open it up. I know one other thing that you've spoken about before and you know, looking at the background where you are there right now, it's a fairly minimalist background. You know, what do we need in our lives in order to be happy both internally and surrounding us externally? Would you mind um, commenting on that a little bit? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, that's a, a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I I like minimalism. So uh, not only in my uh, in my work as a photographer, but also uh, in my house. So as you can see behind me, there's no colors in my house. Everything is uh, is it's just about shapes and contrasts. So there's only black, white, and different shades of gray. Uh, but I also like minimalism in my in my in my thinking. I like to keep things organized and um, but one of the things that I learned in, in, my, uh, in my job as, a, as an international wildlife photographer um, uh, going all over the planet is how little I actually need. And uh, before this, I worked in advertising and I was promoting, um, uh, I was encouraging people to buy stuff. Mm. And that's what I did for 15 years as an art director. And I also had a lot of stuff myself and then when I started traveling and photographing uh, for years on end I didn't we didn't even have a home we just traveled and we had we both had a, had a large suitcase and that's everything we had mm -hmm. and then after a few years we realized you know this is basically all we need some clothing shoes and just food and drinks and, and, and shelter but really nothing nothing more mm -hmm. so um yeah, I think that's also important to to realize that it's it's not about the stuff. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, let me let's turn it over to Marilyn. I know there have been some questions that have come up in the chat box, and she's our master of ceremonies for the queries in the chat box. So, Marilyn, would you mind uh, firing away? No, I don't mind at all. And um, I mean, one of these came from me and it, it's not a question. It was just as you were going through the pictures, I found myself, thank goodness I was off. Uh, and I had my mute on because I found myself, you know, having these incredible, you know, feelings that are, were coming out of my mouth. And uh, Kate here says that, you know, these images are so incredible. Um, and so there's, you know, the logical question. I mean, how do you set these up? I don't think you say to the lion, would you just, you know, show me your angry look. Uh, how, how do these uh, pictures find their way into your camera? 
Um, you know, are they, uh, do you wait for incredible amount of time in order to get a picture or is there no formula? No, there's definitely a formula. So uh, the most important thing to realize is that as a wildlife photographer, I have little to no influence over my subjects. So uh, un unlike a fashion or like a fashion photographer, yeah, I can, you, you can say to the model, like move to the left or move to the right. The animals never listen to, uh, to what I say, nor do they have any uh, idea about photography. So uh, the only thing that I can do is I can really study and learn about their behavior in an effort to uh, maybe predict what they're going to do. That's one. And um, the other one you mentioned uh, that's correct is patience. Uh, if that's one thing that wildlife stores have, it's tons and tons of patience mm -hmm. and determination. So we keep trying and we keep being patient. So uh, the images that you that I showed you, um, that's really like some of the best images that I shot and the result of uh, 15 years of trying. So uh, that's not something that, uh, that I usually get in uh, like one visit. So it often takes more than one visit. And then even still, a large part of it is just luck mm -hmm. uh, because I have no influence on the behavior of a wild animal. So um, when that lion charged my uh, remote controlled camera, I didn't know that it was going to do that. It just did. And, um, and that's how I got that shot. So in, in, in that way, I was just extremely lucky to be there at that time. So it's a, it's a little bit of a combination of all those uh, things. Um, a little bit of, a lot of learning, a lot of patience and a lot of luck. Yeah, there, there was uh, the curious question. And that is how did that monkey get the phone? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, that monkey is uh, a Japanese macaque, also known as a snow monkey. They live in Japan in one very small uh, uh, valley in the mountains. And it's a valley that has natural hot springs. And um, they're the only known primates that, uh, that go into these hot springs for fun, just like people do, which is it's, it's, it's very interesting, I think. Um, as a result, it's very popular location for people to go to. So uh, tourists also go there. And I was there once and there was a, a, a bus of Chinese tourists. And there was <laughs> one lady with her iPhone and she wanted to make uh, close-up photographs of this particular monkey monkey. So she was uh, holding her phone very close to the monkey and closer and closer and closer uh, up until the moment that the monkey thought, this must be a gift. So he snatched it from her hands and then uh, moved away into the, uh, into the hot spring. And then actually immediately dunked it into the water and, uh, and started playing with it. And this is the only frame that I got where it's holding the phone like, uh, like a human would do. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it is amazing, the curiosity of, uh, of animals. Uh, I remember... I had gone to treetops um, in Kenya, and the oh, warning, yeah, the warning was, don't leave your window open uh, unless you know you're you're right there. And I I looked out the window uh, of my little room, and I saw a monkey just throwing had opened someone's suitcase and was throwing everything from the suitcase out. Uh, so. I think, you know, it is the curious nature of us all. Um, yes. Uh, one question here is what organizations are you connected to? Uh, I'm assuming conservation organizations, wildlife organizations. And I think you answered the second part of this, but I'll read it anyway. How can an average person be involved in conservation? Yeah, so that, to start with the last uh, one, there's just so many, it's hard to, uh, to, to start somewhere. Uh, what I usually advise people is that to pick a subject that they care about. So either that's, for instance, a specific region, or it can be a specific animal. And then when you search for that, uh, that animal that is endangered, you'll see that there's all kinds of foundations and organizations uh, that are focused on saving that particular animal. So, for instance, to, to like big big cats, 
in uh, in Africa, there is a foundation called Born Free, and that is an organization that uh, that tries to help uh, uh, lions and uh, save them from ca captivity, for instance. So that's a, that's a very good one. Um, I forgot the first part of your question. Uh, the first one was um, let, let me just scroll back up, and that is how how can the average person become involved? I think you you have really addressed that. Yeah. And are there specific organizations that you might uh, recommend to you know the average person, perhaps uh, to school children uh, or maybe even organizations? Yeah. I've yeah, again, what I would do is I would uh, start with something that you're really passionate about, yeah. because uh, I know people that are very passionate about the oceans and everything that lives in it. And obviously, the ocean is also facing a ton of threats. So um, there is quite a lot of organizations that uh, are, are trying to do their best to uh, for positive change there. So then you can just uh, uh, pick one of one of them. I, I don't know uh, from the top of my head one that I'm going to uh, like promote, but this, that's the way that I would go about so that you you also for yourself that you feel that you're doing something about a region or an animal that you uh, that you care about. Here's here's just a comment. I love that you not only share these amazing images, but that you're educating at the same time. Thank you for that. Um, do you get locals to show you these intimate places or do you just wonder about? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, so no, it's uh, I never wonder about because that would be a, a horrible waste of my time. So uh, what I what I what I always do when I go to a place, um, I will hire people, so specialists, so that can be uh, local guides or there can be local uh, researchers or biologists who, uh, who know the area or who know the subject uh, much better than I do. And I use them to help me to find the species and, um, and to photograph them. Because if I just go myself, uh, that makes very little sense. I would not be uh, very efficient. Yeah. Can you reflect on the connections you have with the animals that you photograph? What have you learned from them? Um, so, yeah, I think the, the one thing that you learn is that you're, you're one of them. Huh? That's, that's probably the most, uh, uh, the most impactful one, that if you're, if, if you're looking at a wild animal and it's looking straight back at you, you, know, you can't help but feel a connection. And um, especially with primates, that is just very, uh, very touching. I've watched, once been touched by a, by a primate who just uh, was a baby one who grabbed my, uh, grabbed my finger like that with its little hands. And that is, that is hard to explain uh, that, to see those tiny little fingers. Um, it's just like a human baby. So those, yeah, those are moments that you realize, you know, these are not just, not just animals. You know, it's, 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 they're, they're one of us, basically. So yeah, that's, I think that's the most profound feeling that you, uh, that you can get. Hmm. This one is really very much a follow-up question. Are animals ever aware of you being near them or that you're photographing them or obviously doing something there? Yeah, I would say most of the time, yes, they are aware that I'm there because animals are, uh, their senses are way, way better than ours. They can often see much better. They can smell better. They can hear better. Um, we, we are very poor at, uh, at our, uh, with, uh, with our senses. So uh, most of the time they know I'm there. And if they are super wild and not used to human presence, that means that I have to stay far away and I use very long lenses. Uh, a lot of times the species uh, are not very skittish. So for instance, on Antarctica, the animals on Antarctica have never been hunted. So they have no negative experiences with people, which is why they are totally not afraid of you. They just walk straight up you, to, uh, up you and, it's, and it's because of that. Um, it probably used to be like that a very long time ago but it's just because of how humans are treating animals 
that animals have become very skittish uh, in general. And the second answer to that question is sometimes I try to be invisible. So I just returned from a trip here in my own country here in South Africa, where I spent uh, several nights in a, in a hide uh, where I was completely invisible. Uh, they couldn't see me, hear me or smell me. And that was the only way to photograph them during the night uh, from super close. Wow. What was the most difficult photograph you have taken and what's been the easiest? Uh, the easiest, I have too many, too many examples of easiest because easiest are always the ones that just, uh, that just happen and I, I just happen to be there and I only have to press the, the shutter button. So um, doesn't happen often, but still many times. The uneasy ones are um, either uh, difficult because it's just difficult to, to find that species, but I've also photographed uh, quite a few things that are just extremely difficult to watch. So an example is for instance, uh, a, lion, a, a tiger cub that is being eaten by another tiger, which is, is not, not, it's not fun. And another example is I've seen a baby elephant being attacked by, uh, by a pride of lions. And then uh, it took them an hour to kill it while it was screaming. And so those moments are, are very, very intense. It's very easy to, uh, to want to look away. But for me, it's really important to, to actually watch that because I think that's, uh, that is all part of nature. And I, I think for me as a wildlife photographer, I need to see exactly uh, what's going on in nature, even though I decide not to, uh, not to share it with the, with the viewers. Okay, uh, another comment. Ah, a remote control camera. No wonder you're still here. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I, I think we've we've gone through the questions. Um, All right. And you know, I was just thinking when when you were talking about the Arctic, um, that must be true of the Galapagos as well. Yes. Yeah. Same reason. Yeah. No, it's protected, and because it's protected, there's generations of wildlife there that have never been hunted and never yeah. been harassed. And uh, uh, that's really all it takes for us to have like a harmonious relationship uh, with nature. So in a sense, in Antarctica, my, the first time I was there, it was wonderful. But at the same time, I thought it was very depressing because it just made me realize just that, like, what have we done? You know, that there's only these, basically these two, places left where the animals are so relaxed with our presence and in the rest of the world they run for their lives mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah marcel um you've obviously been working in this kind of mode for a number of years and one of the things that i'd like to ask you about is that how do you keep things fresh how do you keep coming up with the how does the creative process continue in keep you stimulated and motivated? I think for a large part, that is just my natural curiosity. So I, I'm, I'm just a, a very curious person and I just like to discover things. Um, also, I like to create things that are fresh and, and new. So that drives me to find these, uh, these exotic places and to photograph exotic animals. Uh, has also has to do with my background in advertising, where being original was the most important thing uh, as, as a creative. So I think it's a little bit of uh, a combination uh, of all of that. Also, I tend to think about my own mortality and the fact that I have, uh, I have a limited amount of time and combined with that curiosity. It, uh, yeah, that creates a drive for me to do certain things and also combined with uh, certain important messages, I think that, um, that need to be told. And 
so I can I can use my voice to uh, to do that. Yeah, along with that, um, yeah, I know you don't have a crystal ball and can't look into the future, but looking at um, Marcel uh, Van Oosten um, five years from now, 10 years from now, do you have some visions of, you know, not that we have expectations that things have to go a certain <laughs> way, how do you see things moving from here without putting, putting pressure on yourself? Uh, it's another challenge that we all, all face. Yeah. So yeah, that pressure I, I naturally uh, push on myself, uh, but not in a negative way. I'm, uh, I'm not stressed by it. Uh, yeah, it, it's a difficult question because it's actually something that I'm constantly thinking about. Like, um, and uh, in many ways, this book has uh, is the main reason. So um, for 15 years, I've just been doing what I do. And then uh, during COVID, I spent 14 months working on that book. And I wanted, when, it, when it was finished, it almost felt like I just, I, 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 I closed a chapter, and a, a chapter of my life, and that I was ready for a new chapter. That's how the, the book felt when I held it in my hands. I was like, okay, ready for something else. So that's been going through my, uh, through my head. Uh, at the same time, I absolutely love what I'm doing and I don't have enough yet. So it's very likely that in five years, I'll still be doing what I do now. Uh, how that's going to be in 10 years, I'm not entirely sure. I have, I have a lot of ideas, um, but I'm, I'm not sure what direction uh, everything will go. It sounds like we've been, we've been following a somewhat similar path and that in some ways the COVID was, was a blessing for me um, in that uh, it was an opportunity when the time was right and people approached me about doing a book. I said, okay, let's, let's, this is the time to do it. And so you and I published around the same time, actually with the same, uh, same publishing company. Publisher, uh, yeah. Yeah, same publisher. Ah. So uh, it's, it's kind of uh, ironic. And I've also been starting thinking about, hmm, you know, I want to keep doing this. I'm heading off to India in two days and then Bhutan, but, uh, but you know, what's going to be five years from now? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. yeah, it is interesting. Yeah. There, there is another question here. How many months of the year do you travel? And what about your tours? You take people, I think it says so on your website, right? Yeah. So uh, I, on an, an average year, so that's a non-COVID year, I, uh, my wife and I are on the road nine months, approximately. So nine months a year we're traveling, and three months a year we are not uh, not traveling. And um, so what we what we do is we host photographic tours. So we uh, we run uh, photographic safaris mostly uh, for small groups of. Uh, of photography enthusiasts of, from all over the world. And we teach them about the subjects and about the, uh, the, the, the photography. So basically I'm trying to teach them to become a better photographer and to take better uh, pictures. So that's, our, that's the main source of my income. I should probably explain why very short. Um, being a wildlife photographer, it is very difficult to make a living because the subject matter that I photograph has been around for ages and it doesn't change. Mm. So uh, photographs of an elef elephant taken 50 years ago can still be used. And so that means that there's not a lot of demand for the kind of photography that I do from a commercial point of view. Mm. That means you have to be creative and uh, think of other ways to do that so um, the photo tours is something we started 15 years ago as a, as an alternative way to earn a living okay great so john do you have another question um i think one of the things is we have about 10 minutes left marcel i uh, so i'd like to kind of open it to you about other things that we haven't covered um, but are important to you to share um, oh. 
Now I have to improvise. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough yeah. question. Uh, uh, yeah, no, this is, well, this is a tough question. Yeah. We were talking before we, uh, 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 we were, I was coming up, coming up with some tough questions for him and, and uh, I, 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 I not this stuff. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I can intervene here and just say, uh, what's your hope uh, for the future in wildlife? Obviously, you know, you've mentioned deforestation and, um, you know, just the greed, commercial greed, um, people who hunt animals. But is there, yep. is there a ray of hope? Obviously, there's always hope. Uh, uh, without hope, we, we would all be incredibly depressed. Um, so I, uh, I also have hope. Otherwise, I wouldn't even try to do what I do. Uh, however, one also needs to be realistic. So uh, looking at human nature, especially with regards to, uh, to the environment and to animals, um, we just know from history that people tend to uh, get active and start caring about species when it's almost too late. And this is how we've lost already so many uh, species and not, not like small ones, even like big ones. I mean, we're about to lose the, the black rhino and uh, maybe the white rhino as well. And, and the reason is always um, that we care more about uh, our economy. That's usually what, uh, what governments uh, decide. And it's also how people vote. So the, the primary reason for voting is always money. So people vote for the, for the party that's best for their wallet. And, and that means that that government may not do have the best interest of the of the wildlife and of the uh, environment uh, at heart. So in that way, I'm a bit pessimistic. Uh, at the same time, it's a good thing now that with social media, uh, the internet in general, and how quickly you can uh, bring a message across. Uh, I can post something uh, on the internet and by the end of the day, many thousands of people will have seen it. Some, some of them will have shared it. So that's really the, the positive and the, and the hopeful thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm just hoping that more and more people will, uh, will start using it um, for good and also start looking a little bit further than, um, especially in Western democracies. So in, in the so-called rich countries so not only think about uh, money and economy, but also think about the future and the future of our children and future generations, because they might actually grow up without, uh, without seeing a tiger and without seeing a rhino or a polar bear, because we will have, uh, well, we, would have, we will have been too late. There is one more uh, question here. And uh, it's built on uh, your talking about the monkey, the, the little uh, chimp uh, monkey that held your finger. And so the question is, have you ever had a specific connection that will stay with you forever? One of those goosebump moments. Well, actually, I think that one is, that's, that is the one I would mm -hmm. say. Yeah, because um, it is extremely rare to uh, to get in physical contact with a with a wild animal, uh, actually, it's something that you uh, try to avoid uh, because uh, wild animals are unpredictable and it can have a negative effect or the animal can uh, can harm me. So usually try to avoid that. But in that particular case, it uh, it just happened, and it's just it is just wonderful because that's the closest you can get. To, uh, to wildlife, yeah. So I want to thank both uh, Marcel and, and John. This has been really wonderful. Uh, this is where we go into um, a kind of 
commercial break, uh, just to let you know what's happening with the charter. But it's because of people like you and your contributions that we have uh, the ability to do the kinds of things that we have been doing. So thank you so much. And I'd like to share just a, a few slides uh, with you uh, so that you have them on your save the list. Uh, our next global read in May, May 18th, uh, is with Elizabeth Filippoli from Greece. Uh, she's written a most incredible book, From Women to the World, uh, Letters for a New Century. Um, and then that will be um, facilitated by Lenore Stepsich, who is uh, right now the CEO of the Montessori European Group uh, and who, she, who has, she has worked with uh, in the past. Um, in terms of, you know, we are trying so hard to make Earth Day, Earth Month, Earth Year. Uh, so we will continue with our brand new film series that we started this year with the Connectivity Project. Uh, it's a documentary and it will be available for a number of days from April 26th through May 2nd. Um, and if people have not had an opportunity to read the encyclical by Pope Francis, Ludato C., uh, which is on the environment and earth as our common home. There will be a discussion on April 27th of the encyclical um, and all of the times that we list are Pacific times so that you can check both out on the world clock and then also on our uh, on our website. Uh, there's a special discussion by one of our partners on healing the waters on uh, May 1st at 5.01 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, in terms of our course offerings uh, in this end of the month that we're heading for, uh, our Charter Education Institute will be uh, offering a class starting on April 25th with Diane Kellen Sukra, who has written a book called Safe Cities uh, or Save Our Cities. And this particular course lasts for four weeks, fostering a compassionate community. And then we're very honored to have um, a session with Thomas Hubble on April 26th. And many of you know that he is the expert in looking at collective trauma globally. Um, and this particular introduction of a course, it's just 90 minutes, but it is a preview to a five month commitment uh, of a joint course offered by Thomas Hubble, the Pocket Project and the Charter for Compassion. So. Thank you so much again, and um, we hope you'll join us uh, in one of these other offerings. Thank you so much, Marcel. And don't forget, folks, that uh, John Colkin, who actually didn't talk much about his projects, but you'll have an opportunity uh, to, to see his work in December. And I have a feeling that he'll be joining us for a few other things as well. Goodbye, everyone. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Good luck with your book, John. Yes. Oh.